Hi, my name is Xavier Martinez. I am 19 years of age. I have just graduated high school from the Polytechnic High School in particular. I am now expected to pursue a mature career as a young man. I was indeed a filial entity, so I decided to pack my bags and head to the Miskatonic University Medical School in Arkham. And there I met an amiable, amicable white man with yellow hair and bright blue eyes. He taught me a lot. He was a well-spoken man and at times I would be his apprentice for certain experiments he would perform in front of my eyes. There was one incident where he managed to make a frog's leg shudder and or twitch perpetually. Anyways, I ended up dropping out because I'm not used to being in well densely populated urban areas. I like being alone back in my high school days. People would call me a loner when I would get mad attention from asking teachers questions in class. I returned home, which is Palmdale. It is sultry geographically, and in the mornings, it gets really frigid. It was not surprising because it is a desert, a desert that is located in the northern area of Los Angeles County. Another reason why I left is because I was not used to the environment. I will get spontaneous fevers and a haphazardly feel nausea. I at times needed to do my homework and go to class in proportion, feeling this way regardless. My personality started to become more callous, solemn, stolid, and grave soon after I returned from the Miskatonic University. I will lock myself in my room with windows veiled up in sable curtains and read the principles of communism and the haunting Necronomicon written by the nefarious Abdul al-Hazard. I then bought a laptop and started fooling around with it, going into public webcam chats, interacting or conversing with people all around the world, speaking about politics, music, video games, and or just venturing about anything really. I made a lot of friends though, through this experience, and I thoroughly enjoyed it greatly. Then one day, an intense and crazy incident occurred. One of my family members found me knocked unconscious in my room, lying supinely on the ground. I was then immediately sent to the hospital where I was diagnosed with severe or keen depression. It was certainly uncanny and out of this world. I have never experienced this in my life before. I then started doing research on my ancestors to see if I ever inherited this malady and or mental illness. After doing months and hours of research, I was unsuccessful. I could not find any evidence of any of my ancestors or recent ancestors that had experienced what I have experienced. Although my grandmother informed me that my grandfather's father had a nice and copious diary, he would write every day and write his experiences in great detail. I told my grandmother where was this diary. She said it is presumably stored in the attic back in her house, which was located in the San Fernando Valley. I immediately took the train to the valley to procure this ostensible piece of work that will probably answer my questions on the reason why I am feeling what I am feeling. I finally made it and as the bus desolated me in the old suburban looking neighborhood, I quickly glanced at the livid luster sultry and or ardent sun and resumed in getting that diary. I made it in the house and then I furtively walked up the old wainscoted stairs that will creak intermittently. I made it to the main enormous room and surprisingly it was vacant. I then went into the garage to obtain a ladder so I can get inside the attic. Once I finally made it into the attic, I was certainly hot. I immediately perspired from my forehead substantially and then at the corner of the attic I beheld a brown leather bound book that was girdled with a white string. The book was titled Jesus Marigas Diary. Did only that it is indeed my grandfather's diary. Finally I obtained it. When I opened it up I beheld the most anomalous, strange, eerie thing ever. It was something indescribable, ineffable, ostensibly unimaginable and unintelligible. After skimming through the pages of the diary, it ended up not actually being about my great-grandfather's life. It was instead actually about mine. 2. It was the most surprising thing ever. It was documenting itself all the way to my present stage in life. It was even giving a precise detail of me visiting my grandmother's house. I then closed the book and immediately headed home. As soon as I made it, I quickly opened up my laptop and logged in into my online webcam chat room and started to interact with my community on there. Everything I have learned and experienced. Everyone there was skeptical and dubious and redubitable of what I had to say. Then, after spending many hours trying to convince them, a stranger joined the call. It was a woman. She spoke in an effeminate Indian accent, saying hi to everyone in the call. Her cam was dim, but then realized it was like that because she wore a black veil over her frail-looking body. I responded saying hi back, and she was shy at first, but then started opening up a lot more after 30 minutes of talking. 
Her name, she said, was Tashim Malik. She was from Pakistan but lived most of her life in Saudi Arabia and expounded that the veil she was wearing over her was called a niqab. When I spoke to her on the cam, she had amazing glowing and coarse getting dark brown eyes. I immediately kind of liked her. We commerced a lot about her culture, which is oriental culture. She said that her land lies a desert forever untroubled by man, all yellow it is, spotted with shadows of stones like a leopard lying in the sun. The more I spoke to her, the more she would copiously open up about her personal problems. She denoted that she was experiencing depression at the same extent I am, but her reasons were not spontaneous. She was experiencing it because she was in an abusive household where there was excessive domestic abuse going on. Her father would beat her haphazardly just to let his stress and anger out by lambasting someone more subordinate than him. Her father is indeed pathetic. One day she quickly broke down in tears and incessantly implored me to bring her to America where I lived in Palmdale. I mean, I thought about it for a while and after all I do live in an empty house. Most family members moved out vacationing and or working 24-7 couch benching with friends. I hardly ever see any of them. After contemplating, I decided to book her a flight to Los Angeles Airlines. I wanted a companion to share the same mental health problems with and hopefully cure together. And regardless, I really liked her. I presumably couldn't wait to caress Koi, her salacious slash of his brown skin she would hide underneath that black cotton fabric of hers. She said we will not be speaking to each other in the next few weeks, due to now she has to furtively and or clandestinely devise or scheme a plan to achieve this feat without her abusive father knowing. I then excuse her and let her know that I cannot wait to meet her in person finally. But in the meantime, I beheld the most uncanny and strange thing ever and it was utterly unintelligible. My great grandfather's diary was no longer about a biographical life about me, it was in fact now about Tafshin Malik's. It was anomalies, but presumably because I am really emotionally close to her. Regardless of that, I was interested in knowing more about her, so I was utterly keenly enthusiastic. As I was skimming through the pages of the diary, I have read Tafshin's life. It was actually decent. Although she did grow up in a conservative household, she had opportunities. She went from grade school to college for free and uh, or gratuitously. She lived in a well-built medium-sized house. The more I read and scrutinize the pages, the more I got interested in her life. Then something really struck my attention and it was her grandfather. His name was Mohammed bin Laden. He had 52 children because of the wealth he had gained from the American Empire. Apparently his children engaged in lots of inbreeding. One of his sons married a close relative and had Tafshin. Then I skimmed more through the pages and it disclosed that Tafshin would go into an extreme mental breakdown and gradually transmute into an autistic child and will need to be dependent on a more mentally stable companion. Presumably, I will be that unknown companion. 3. From there, the diary stopped documenting her life for some reason. It has been a month now and did not hear from her at all. I started speculating that she will indeed contact me after just continuing my life, I felt stressed a lot more. My brain at times felt as if it would not function well. It is like as if it is not fully convoluted but rudimentary. I found my, myself sleeping for many hours, and one time I had a dream of my great grandfather. I would have visions of him walking around shopping centers in Orange County, where the setting seemed to be around in the 1940s. He beheld taking good in signs such as no Mexicans and Filipinos allowed. He, beheld, he felt as if his life was always in danger walking down those streets. There was this one incident he was utterly hungry and needed to go to the restroom and he ended up traveling into the desert area just to go urinate. After that incident occurred, he just stayed at home in his desecrating cabin and only cooked for himself. There was another incident where he was working at a factory that manufactured necessities for the war. He got utterly depressed because his fellow white co-worker kept calling him Pedro when he knew that was not in fact his name. After the war, where the fascists were defeated, he lost his job because there was no more work needed over there anymore. It was utterly strange because soon after I awoke from this dream, I experienced a keen and or severe feeling where I was panicking wanting to gasp and vomit at the same time. I cannot even get out from my bed. Maybe my dream was true. My 
The great-grandfather presumably committed suicide because of these incidents and the children he brought into this world inherited that same depression. Thus, probably this is why I have this mental malady. After contemplating over this, I found this very interesting. It is very unfortunate my great-grandfather had to go through that. Now that I think about it, history is just repeating itself in the 21st century where Donald Trump was elected president whom is known to be a racist against Mexicans. For the next few weeks, I still did not hear from Tufshin, and my mental health was nothing but retrogressive. I would wake up in the middle of the night and feel anxiety and dismay from the more horrors that my great-grandfather would go through. I would then have these in paroxysms until the point I feel lethargy and somnambulate perpetually around my house where at times I would finally languish and plump into the ground in a prostrating manner where my physical body and mind are subject towards the debility. Nevertheless, I started deploring on when will Tafshin finally come. I have been missing her or hankering to see her in person. I went to my kitchen to serve me some soda and water my plants, and I would intermittently glance at my colonial window, which had a purview of my front yard, hoping I would see her one day. I then went back to sleep and recollected another chastising, discriminatory incident. My great-grandfather encountered a sailor whilst in his way to the liquor store to buy some snacks, and so he looked up and glimpsed at the white sailor's reddish-pink face where it was caused by the sultry sun that day. The sailor then uttered nothing but contumely to his face, such things like greaser and bean eater. He was certainly a jingoistic Anglo-American. My great-grandfather was diametrically provoked and agitated, so he socked him in the face, then scampered away from him as fast as he could. He then quickly made it into a neighborhood where he would precariously leap over fences, where at one point he encountered a golden retriever gnawing at him ferociously. He managed to escape and make it back home, but with an empty stomach. He never had the chance to buy snacks from the liquor store, thus he improvised and made quesadillas with cheese that had a smidgen of greenish mold, which he regretted eating because it made him wretch a few minutes later. 4. I came back from my nap and looked out my window and spotted someone. When I got a better look of the contours of the figure, I noticed it was a woman. I quickly got up from my bed and looked at another window and it was her, Tough Sheen, but she was not wearing her niqab, she was wearing a red loose blouse disclosing cleavage. She was like a model, very voluptuous. She made it to my front door and started knocking. I then went and opened it with no hesitation. She was utterly lascivious and salacious, her face was tawny brown with sheen, coarse getting dark brown eyes and her breasts were olive skinned. She had long black twenties straight hair that would oscillate and or undulate facilely in a windy environment. I was petrified. I did not want to say a single word to her because I felt I would bumble, so I froze a bit, then persevered. Oh, hello Tufshin, is that you? Yes, Xavier, this is me. She uttered with an amiable smile. Wow, come in please. She then walked in, observing my home as she would pursue me into my living room. When I glanced back at her, I would unwittingly get tantalized by her breasts. I then pointed to my couch, indicating that she can now sit. So, how was the flight over here? It was good. So, how are you feeling? Are you feeling depressed right now? No, absolutely not. I'm so happy I'm with you now. You mean for the past few days you've never been sad over what your father had done to you? No, I'm over it. She said tersely. Oh, well, I don't understand. I was hoping we would help each other recover and or convalesce interchangeably. I'm thirsty. I want something to drink. She abruptly said. She then got up waiting for me to lead her. Yes, follow me. What do you want? Soda or some water? I want some water, please, with ice. She leaned against the counter of my kitchen and merely waited for me. After I was done and served her the drink, she quenched and her quaffed herself sorry with mirth. I then was contemplating whether or not I should tell her she would mentally transmute into an autistic child and that I would be the one looking after her. But I do not want to tell her about my diary and its necromantic powers. But then again, I do not know what I should do. Should I persist and cherish and watch over her until my last days or let her know and bewilder her into consternation, apprehension, and or formidableness? Anyways, we met back at the living room. 
Hey Tufshin. So if you're doing fine, I guess you'll need to look after me because I'm certainly am not. I get headaches spontaneously and experience horrible dreams of my great grandfather, and I at times feel lethargic and sleepwalk. Oh well, I'm sorry to hear that. I will take good care of you. Just don't worry, Xavier. Yes, thank you. So please feel free to make yourself at home. You can swoon in the room across from my room in the corridor. Yes, thank you. So what can I do to help you right now? For now, nothing. But please make yourself at home. Take a shower and make yourself some dinner. I'm gonna go to my room and soon for a bit. I went to my room and just plumped my body onto my comfy bed and fell asleep. The next day in the morning, I haphazardly awoke hearing boisterous knocks on my door. It was Tafshin. She asked me if I wanted some thai tea. My rejoinder was yes. Tafshin was now disclosing herself as a emulous, subservient maid or servant, and I am fond of it. After about 20 minutes, she came in my room abruptly with my thai tea. Uh, thank you. You are welcome. When I took a sip from the tea, I was not incommoded. It tasted good. Were you assiduous when you made this tea? Yes, certainly. I just want to appease you as much as I can. After all, you are feeling sick. And also while you were napping, you were, never mind. It was nothing. I was what? Tell me. She remained silent, thus agitating me a little. Look, if you have something to tell me, I will not remonstrate. No, it's nothing, Xavier. Just relax. She uttered as she leaned down on my bed, showing her aphrodisiacal cleavage whilst wearing a v-neck gray t-shirt. Just leave me now. I will be out any minute to eat something. I'm getting hungry. Okay, I'll be out waiting for you. She instantly left my room. I then quickly started rummaging my closet to get my diary and ran into my restroom and started to rip every page into pieces and throwing them into the garbage. I cannot let Tufshin find out about her ominous fate, which is her mental state becoming retrogressive. I then went into the kitchen and beheld Tufshin sitting in the table enjoying herself some breakfast. There are eggs and bacon I have made. Oh, okay. I then served myself and sat adjacent from her. Tafshin, why are you being perfidious? I thought we were going to help each other recover from our depression. Yes, I understand. But can I just treat you like my little brother? You see, I had to take care of him due to the fact that he was overworked by his boss. He would do strenuous work that was immensely fatiguing. So I would appease him with massages and by making lunch and breakfast for him every day. I know how to cook. I can cook whatever you want, Xavier. I wanted to deride her offer, but after all, I am all alone in this vacant abode. Fine, but you said it. I want you to treat me like you treated your little brother, and from now on, I want you to refer to me as your brother and not Xavier, because I never had a sister, and so I wanted to see how it's like to have one. I told her in an imperative manner. Yes, thank you, brother. She shrieked in joy and gave me a comforting hug where I felt her soft, squishy boobs against my chest. I then stared at my dish and finished up my breakfast. 5. I started feeling a strong headache, I guess. My depression is kicking in again, but the headache was certainly not lenient. So I left my kitchen and hastily headed to my room, and I jumped onto my bed, swaddling myself with my comfortable blankets. Tafshin pursued me and loquaciously spoke, but I could not understand her due to my headache was assailing me substantially. That was all I remembered before I blacked out. I awoke in the middle of the night and yelled for Tafshin. She did not come for me. I was there desolate in my ho bed hopeless for like about 30 minutes. She finally opened up my door. Is everything alright, brother? No. <laughs> I'm hungry. Can you make me a peanut butter and sandwich or something? My stomach is burning. Okay, brother. Would you like something to drink as well? Yes, a glass of water with some ice. Okay, I'll be right back. I lay there in dismay, not knowing what just happened. What I was experiencing had to be immemorial. I hope I was not precariously sleep-talking, giving away all my secrets to this tremulous world. Tafshin finally came back. Brother, here you go. Oh, thank you. 
Now, sister, I want to ask you something. What is it? Was I sleep talking? Yes, well, a little you were saying things about your great grandfather. Well, whatever I said, it was not voracious. Get some more sleep, brother. Here, let me spoil you by singing surah right next to you on your bed. No, I'm not tired anymore. I got up from my bed and I precipitately sidled out of my room. Wait, where are you going, brother? Come back, you need more sleep. Tashfin bellowed. When I traversed the threshold of my door, I tremulously stumbled in the middle of the corridor and felt an impulse and needed to say a word. But in lieu, I remembered the syllable G. It is clear that my mind is becoming feeble and my mental stability is petering out into debility or dementia. Oh my god. Brother, you need to go to bed right now. It's two o'clock in the morning. Listen how about later? In the afternoon we have breakfast lunch, like pancakes with lots of syrup and fresh strawberries on top. She uttered as she helped me up and tucked me into bed. She then sat there beside me singing Surah, which is a chapter from the Quran. She was my real-life hori or brown nymph. Her voice was like an effeminate dove. Thus I gradually swooned in peace, and there I was flippantly hopeless and careless of my future. It feels like as if my dead body corpse and her carcass would sink down into my bed, submersing natural brooks of underground caves all the way until I reach hell, leaving Tavshin alone in this cold and solid world, which I believe basically makes me a fratricide. It was early afternoon now and I met Tavshin in my culinary room and conversed about what happened that night. She would sometimes divert the topic of the discussion and engage in persiflage, could it be that her mental state is petering out also? Is a foreboding advent finally taking effect, wherewith I have learned from my quaint necromantic diary? We talked about what it could have meant when I had the insufferable impulse of wanting to say a word but only managing to say the first part of it. Anyways, after the discussion, I went back into my room and left my door ajar in case of she needs to come in here fast for an emergency. As soon as I plumped on my comfy bed, Tavshin called me. So I ineluctably and briskly went into the living room, and when I beheld Tavshin, she queried and were asked if I wanted homemade cheeseburgers. After contemplating for a few seconds, I realized I had a pack of frozen patties in my freezer. I rejoined in acceptance of the offer. As I glimpsed away from her, I saw her stumble a little in my peripheral vision as she stood up from the couch. I tried to help her, but she refused any assistance. I'm just thinking in my head that the juncture is near. Anyways, I sat on my couch in the living room. As I hear a lot of clattering in the kitchen, she is going to be in there for a while because her stumble was certainly concomitant to her dementing advent. I also noticed another thing diametrically weird and strange. When I saw her apparel before she went into the kitchen, it was inside out. She can now not even dress herself properly. 6. When Tafshin came back into the living room with my plate of two cheeseburgers, I merely relished myself. I'm indeed gonna get corpulent if I keep eating greasy foods like this, but it tastes so good. I told Tavshin that she was wearing her burgundy tank top and gray loose trousers inside out. She was then in complete shock when I informed her about this. Hence, she briskly went into her room to don her apparel correctly. After I finished my first burger, I felt full, so I saved the last for the nonce and stored it in my refrigerator. But soon after I closed the door of my refrigerator, I hear the most ignominious, irritating, and beleaguering screams. The shouts and her high-pitched yelps were coming from the guest room where Tavshin was staying. I believe it was her whom was vociferating. The shrieks were accumulating in sound and causing a plethora of reverberations and resounds. I energetically and quickly ran into Tavshin's room and henceforth witnessed and her beheld the most anomalous, ineffable, and strange purview ever. If anyone else saw this, they would want to commit suicide. Alhamdulillah, that I am an intrepid brown hearty. I saw Tavshin supinely laying on the floor, bumbling words and murmuring things quietly. I picked her up in a compelling manner and forced her to sit on her bed. She randomly, arbitrarily, and unwittingly became taciturn, and as I pried her scrutinized face, visage, and her countenance, it looked as if her face would contort and convulse intermittently. This signifies and or infers that she is indeed autistic and can no longer communicate with me. Her face turned sad as if she was going through grief, and her state was insufferable. Her now prosaic disposition was so sturdy and had somewhat consciousness. She grabbed my arms and moved them back and forth, implicitly beckoning and corroborating that she indeed cannot speak. 
After ruminating on how to solve this problem, I came up with the idea of buying a talking keyboard. That way she can just type things and have a robotic voice say it aloud. So I briskly exited my house, waited at the bus stop, and headed straight to the store to buy a talking keyboard. I found one for $1.99, picked it up, and headed back into my abode. When I made it home, I saw of Sheen in the kitchen performing culinary duties. I went and approached her and grabbed her by the arm with my right hand whilst ordering her to get back in her room in a demanding manner. I then let go of her arm and let her return. Hence, I met her in there and started unboxing the talking keyboard device. I gave it to her and she typed in some words and the device ended up working. She annoyingly queried what exactly was happening to her. I then started smelling an uncoming, strong, horrible, morbid smell. I was stupefied I could not believe this, but the smell was coming from Tufshin. As I saw her immersed in playing with the talking keyboard, like a little girl playing with her dolls, the stench and orfredor was accumulating, starting to smell like hydrogen sulfide and an ardor. She was certainly not immaculate. I told her to go take a shower, but she surprisingly refused, so I struck her on the left cheek with a slap. Due to I was utterly offended that she wanted to keep assailing my nostrils with her cadaverous body that immensely stunk. She then briskly and quickly ran out the room with her eldritch twitching grimace while weeping in agony from the front area of her cephalic appendage. From that moment, I realized that I am just of Sheen's father at this point. She is back dealing with the same problems again, but I am feeling tired. I have horrid problems of my own. I cannot afford to initiate more problems in my life. Like now, I have to look after Tufshin like a helicopter parent and gingerly perform calisthenics while having painful headaches. I heard a boisterous sound resembling someone punching a tub. I went to the bathroom and paced around its ajar door and asked Tufshin if she was fine, but she did not respond at all with the talking keyboard, which she now treats like a talisman. I entered the bathroom and while athwart from the tub, I saw Tufshin helplessly convulsing her chaste innocuous body, wherewith looked immensely at her disciple like a young petite gazelle. I propped her fetid naked body against the tub and put the talking keyboard beside the sink, since according to this whole scenario, Tufshin is a moribund infant, so she is going to be a novice in taking showers now. Henceforth, she is no longer my sister, she is just a burden in my life. I grabbed the sponge and soaked it with soap and water and started scrubbing her body, anatomizing it as if a doctor would do when he is trying to embalm a carcass. But she was there consciously quivering while intermittently making rueful and her penitent facial expressions. I then used the shampoo and scrubbed her scalp and black tenuous hair, causing lots of foam which made a smidgen amount of effervescing sounds. I again did another vivisection, scrubbed her body thoroughly, making sure the stench is gone for good. But in the process of doing that, Tufshin started to be stubborn and resist me, as she was frustrating and antagonizing me with her nuisance. I continued to be a little more rough on her and mangled her arms and shoulders, potentially maiming her. I was stronger, so she got tired, thus gradually stopped. I began caressing her salacious tawny olive skin with my fingertips, calming her down even more, while she was perfectly steadfast. This act began to exhibit that my massages were indeed so horrific. After I finished up cherishing Tufshin by swaddling her with a nice clean white towel and embedding her in comfy blankets, I took a quick shower and went to bed myself. It was morning now, and I wanted to spend as much time as I can with her before that haunting advent finally takes effect. I got up from my bed and confronted her in her room. She was looking carnal and frail like a gazelle, but then I started to smell that fetor again, but only a little bit. Her presence was only specious now. I grabbed a towel from my closet and a pail from my garage and filled it with water mixed with soap to wash her up in her sleep because she was surprisingly deep asleep. She would not move a muscle. When I caressed her neck with a t wet towel, she began moaning and wincing with her eyes closed. By this point, she was abounding with drips of water and diminutive bubbles that would permeate and pearl on her skin. I cheekily gave more force in the washing her. After I was done, I gazed into her coarse getting eyes as she lingered on her bed in agony. She then grabbed her talking keyboard and typed if I wanted to go out and grab something to eat. I accepted and told her I had a surprise for her. I headed straight into my garage and rummaged for some old clothing and luckily found a china poblana in one of the buried cardboard boxes where was my mother presumably bought in Mexico a long time ago. I purloined it and showed it to her. She gave me an illicit facial expression at first, but I gradually assuaged her to wear it. It could be plausible that she knows she is slowly dying, 
so she became pessimistic and just acquiescently decided to wear it. When we made it to the sidewalk in the manner of trying to make it to the bus stop promptly, I have noticed that Sheen was walking a lot slower than me. I adjusted my speed closer to her and then queried her what was happening, and so she forlornly pulled out her talking keyboard from her purse. Brother, you need to walk ahead of me because in Islam it's haram for a woman to walk ahead of a man. Oh, okay, but try to keep up with me. Yes, brother. We made it to the bus stop and waited for a few minutes before the bus finally came. We spotted at a prosaic shopping center and spotted a Mexican restaurant that had outdoor dining. There was a pursuing canopy in front of its entrance, but the lights were off, of course, since the weather was really hot and the sun was shining brightly. We decided to go there. We sat at the table and ordered tacos that be said for the both of us. Tafshin and I exchanged jocose remarks as we surfeited ourselves with delicious tacos that had cilantro, onions, and hot salsa. After we had finished, I was really bloated and Tafshin felt like she needed to perform a notch dance for me. So she got up from her chair and approached me to perform some belly dancing. Her curvy hips were moving sideways and oscillating in a pattern, and I was just petrified. But I tried to keep my sober composure. She brought an unimaginable energy and suspense. It made my arm hairs bristle. I was mesmerized by her salacious contours forthwith. Her dancing was just perfect. It was as if her cunning moves was merely a faculty. Her calisthenics only lasted 15 seconds though, before she went back into her seat panting in exhaustion. We were all finished. When the waitress came back, I tipped her and gazed at her walking away, counting her tip in calculation, but I knew she was content regardless because I tipped her a fecundity amount of dead presidents. We went out our way and walked around the shopping center and found a jewelry store, thus we decided to stop hither. I proceeded to Sheen when we entered the shop and the employee waylaid us in suspense coming out of nowhere and entreated us to buy some of his gems at a discount, but we just came to look. We beheld the most astonishing gemstones. There were a manifold of uncut gems, rubies, jaspers, jades, and purple black pearls. I then stared at Tafshin's face and she was happy to see them. I assume it reminded her of home. When I looked away from her, I scowled, thinking you are never going back home. You are going to die hither with me. Those indelible memories she has from home certainly will be sabotaged when she experiences her moribund juncture. Tafshin then glanced at me, intimating that she wants to now bid the shop a goodbye. When we left the shop, I made sure Tafshin was behind me and led the way as we were walking to exit the shopping center. I had an impulse to tell her that her future is pure perdition any time now, but I persisted and fought it. We made it to the bus stop and waited a little over 30 minutes to catch the bus. When we finally made it to the house, I assisted Tafshin to undress and shower, just like yesterday, and went to our beds and soon before 11 o'clock forthwith. I woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning, hearing some yelps and moans from Tafshin. The yelps were getting louder and realized that she was exclaiming for help, but that was not the only realization I understood. I felt the most weird, strange, and quaint thing ever. What I was feeling was certainly immemorial. I do not know what is happening to me, but it is just so indescribable. I would need to write a 50,000 word description for you to fully conceive and understand me. I do not even think the top psychiatrists and doctors will be able to identify my haunting predicament. But I can just say succinctly that my body was paralyzed. I could not move at all. It stupefied me and that impulse in needed to say a word came back into my head again. But this time it came stronger than ever. The only thing I thought of now was Tafshin all alone in her bed, insufferably vociferating brother help, and how her surly yelps would reverberate in her room, assailing her ears until the point they start to bleed. I am under this tribulation due to historical racism and psychological inheritance. My mind has been perpetually mangled and can no longer persevere, so I am going to release. Greaser, bean eater, greaser, greaser, bean eater, greaser, greaser, bean eater, greaser, bean eater, greaser.